<laughs> wow, look at those numbers. Look at you folks pouring in for this. I love it. The, my participant number, I get to watch you guys as, as we open up this webinar. I get to, I get to watch. It's almost like watching the, the countdown, but the count up timer. Uh, so this is, I'm very, very impressed. I'm very, very impressed that you guys uh, knew that this, this was the one to come to. This is, um, is, I've been looking forward to this myself. So where are we at? 300 and oh, we're over 300 participants. Listen, okay, listen, you guys. If we get to like 400, I can't do this because I get nervous <laughs> in front of large groups. Uh, 340 numbers are starting to, oh, you know, you guys are still rolling in. I'm going to give you another few seconds before I begin my spiel. Uh, but, oh, we are past the 350 halfway mark. I'm going to attribute this to the, the absolute stunning popularity of our guest today because uh, her work is incredibly both um, amazing and accessible. You know, when you can have both of those things. Are we going to make it to 400, you guys? Oh, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. But there's more than enough of you. Uh, for, for us to get this started. So uh, I will say hello, everyone. Gather round, gather round, hear ye, hear ye. Uh, <laughs> friends, Romans, countrymen, <laughs> students, teachers, travelers, truth seekers, town criers, bridge builders, whistleblowers, voters, and fellow humans. I call this evening to order as we go past the 400 mark. I love it. Welcome one and all to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. Uh, welcome back to our returning audience members. A hail and hearty hello to our new listeners, our first timers, and a special what's up to those of you who are watching the recording. And I really want to thank all of you right now for rescuing me from watching night four of the Republican <laughs> National Convention. I think this is so much uh, a better way of spending my time because you guys know that Skeptical Inquirer Presents is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord. I am your host. I'm also a co-host for Point of Inquiry, which is the podcast for the Center of Inquiry. And you know, you can listen to POI wherever you choose to get your podcasts. If you're not already, I say go on and treat yourself to a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. And you know, if you want to be up on the latest information, uh, be sure to check out CFI's Coronavirus Resource Center. And you can find that at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. And if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me and my work at veryfunnylady.com because I'm so incredibly modest. Uh, <laughs> the flow of tonight's Skeptical Inquirer Presents will be a little different. Uh, this is not a presentation, but a conversation that I get to have with our guest about the role of cognitive dissonance in the pandemic. Uh, I know we only have an hour to do this, but we're gonna manage. Um, and now after we chat and she cures me of all my ills, hopefully some of yours, there will be time for questions. And if you're a first time with us, you will notice at the bottom of your screen, um, if you're on a computer a little off to your right, there's actually a little box that says Q&A. That's where you will type your questions in the form of a question. And we will try to get to as many of them as we can uh, within the hour. But just so you know, uh, our guest this evening is a social psychologist, author, and feminist. That means we already have two things in common. She is a public intellectual who has devoted her career to writing and lecturing about the contributions of psychological science to the beliefs and practices that guide people's lives and to criticizing psychobabble, biobunk, and pseudoscience. We love that here. Uh, she is the author of several books, including Anger, The Misunderstood Emotion, although I think my mom understood it very well, uh, the, Mis the Mismeasure of Woman, why women are not the better sex, the inferior sex, or the opposite sex. Really? We're not better? <laughs> I just, 
you know, that's what I've been running on. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to admit that maybe I'm wrong here. Uh, but the book of reference for this evening uh, that she co-wrote with Elliot Aronson is Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. Why We Justify Foolish Beliefs, Bad Decisions, and Hurtful Acts. This book actually has been updated this year with a new chapter. I believe it came out uh, at the beginning of the month. And that new chapter is Dissonance, Democracy, and the Demagogue. Hmm. I wonder who that chapter is about. <laughs> And with that, I welcome our guest, uh, Carol Tavares. Carol, I, I let me uh, unhide your video here so that uh, everyone who is here to see you ah. can indeed see you. I there we are. Our gallery view, and you. Ooh, we are we are close to 500 folks who who are. Ooh. Yeah, I know. I know. What? I have. <laughs> I've got a bit of stage fright here. This is awesome. Ooh. I think this is our highest number so far. They want to so hear me problem. solve your problems, Leanne, I guess. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe they, you're not clinical, so you're not really, although nope, you, you, nope. Do, you, you do look like you have the office for it right now with that <laughs> fabulous CNN bookcase um, in the background. I, I have to tell you, I, I told you privately, but I'll say this publicly. You know, I, I've read the book. You know, I've, I've watched you speak. And wow, I, there are people I feel that I need to call up and apologize too. I've been revisiting and rethinking decisions I've made, you know, stances I've taken, and I'm kind of cringing. <laughs> I'm cringing on the hills. I just, I didn't need to die on. Um, as I mentioned, I was watching, I did watch as much as I could of the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention uh, for two reasons. One, to be fair, and two, so I could observe cognitive dissonance in real time. <laughs> Who's? It, oh, theirs, <laughs> theirs. Okay. I, well, it's always theirs. We never really see it in ourselves, but we will get to that. Um, and actually, before we do get too deep in, um, Carol, I, I really do want to get the most out of this conversation. And so I, I'd like to make sure that we're all on the same page and, and I'd like to define our terms. And I, I kind of, you know, joke that you're not clinical, you're a social psychologist, but uh, can you tell us what that is and what you do and, and how can I get that job? <laughs> <laughs> well, social psychology is a field that I love from the first time I encountered it. All what it means is, first of all, it's a an academic um, branch of psychology. Clinical psychology is often its own area as the study of, uh, of how to change, fix, repair people. Social psychology, as Elliot Aronson says, is about change, is about changing our systems, changing our lives, changing our behavior, understanding how other people influence us all the time. So really all the social psychology means is that we are the field that studies the influence of other people on us, whether we're sitting alone in our room or whether we are out on a protest march, but it is about our social environment. And so we get to study everything from love to war, from prejudice and hatred to sex and joy. Pretty broad charter for my profession. And when I was starting out, what really interested me was communicating what I regarded as the really important findings of social psychology to the public that's so used to getting its stories about psychology as therapy. Therapists have yes. the public ear, if you will. They have the public ear in the courts where they testify, I know that this person you know, committed this because of whatever the reasons and so forth. So people think of psychology and they think of therapy, yes. but social psychology is really much more empirically and scientifically based. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for, for explaining that. So no, everybody, uh, if your question in the chat is how can you get an appointment, I can tell you now <laughs> the answer is no. This is it. This is what we're doing. Now we have tossed around the term cognitive dissonance. It is in the title of, of this conversation tonight. So just again, so that we all know, can you please define it for us before we go what, forward? Absolutely. What is it? Well, it's so funny. I mean, Elliot and I have watched the popularity of this term in the media, in cartoons, in jokes, in, you know, on Jeopardy, and, you, know, you see it everywhere. And people sometimes get it right. All it refers to, I say all, because it's a lot bigger than the definition. What cognitive dissonance is, is the experience of having two beliefs that you hold logically contradict each other, or having a belief that you hold 
contradicted by your behavior. What that means is, I mean, the classic example is the smoker, a smoker who knows that smoking is bad for you and it's harmful and it could kill you eventually and it's a terrible thing and yet wants to keep smoking. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. And as Leon Festinger, who first developed the theory of cognitive dissonance in the 50s said, it is as motivating, it is as uncomfortable as hunger or thirst. We don't live easily in a state of cognitive dissonance. It's uh, like a homeostatic mechanism. It goes along below awareness and we reduce it, we resolve it to maintain comfortable consonants. So the smoker has to quit smoking or justify smoking. A person who is confronted with unmistakable evidence that their lifelong belief in X, Y, or Z is wrong is going to face dissonance over this new information. What do I do? Change my medical practice? Give up the radical mastectomy that I've been doing on my female patients for years just because the evidence shows that lumpectomy is as safe and not disfiguring? Do I really want to give that up? So we are faced personally and professionally and politically all the time with ideas that cause some dissonance with what we believe and what we do in our lives. The really important thing I think to understand about dissonance, people say, oh, well, you know, isn't it just the same thing as, um, you know, we lie, we lie to other people to justify our behavior. When you know you're lying, that is not reducing dissonance. You know you're lying and you're doing it to get your way, to get the other person to like you, to avoid a divorce, you know, to get a job, to get a promotion, to make money. People lie, that's not what's interesting. What dissonance theory shows us is that it is the mechanism by which we lie to ourselves mm. to preserve our beliefs that we are good, kind, competent, moral, intelligent people. When faced with evidence that we weren't so good, we weren't so kind, we hurt another person, we're holding a foolish notion, how many people want to say, oh, thank you so much for this really <laughs> wonderful information. I knew it, you know, I knew right along. No, what they do is they tell you to piss off and take your stupid study with you. Um, what, what Eliot's work showed in making cognitive dissonance theory, a theory of self-justification was this. When the information that we get hits a fundamental concept we hold about ourselves, that is when it is the most painful. If you have a favorite celebrity who behaves like a dork, it's uncomfortable for you, but it's not something you necessarily have to justify. But when we believe ourselves to be skeptical, smart, competent, <laughs> and then we're shown that maybe we're not, it's those are the kinds of dissonances that we find hardest to accept. And one of the great themes of our book is that it helps us understand that the problems we face are not just from bad people who do bad things and justify the bad things they do. I'm sure we could all think of a few people who fit that description. We, our problems also stem from good people who justify the bad things they do in order to preserve their belief that they're good people. Mm. The doctors who don't change their practices aren't bad doctors. They're not, they don't lack compassion. They don't lack kindness. But you're telling me that this thing I've been doing to women all these years was killing my patients, harming my patients. I'm a good, kind, compassionate, smart doctor. Don't tell me I'm wrong. So, so those are the challenges. Doing... They keep yeah. doing it. Mm -hmm. So, so we're. This is not necessarily about the in the it put this in, in a in a Star Wars reference. It's not about the Jedi's, the perennial good people. You know, the holier than thou's. Mm -hmm. It's not about the Sith, the clearly evil. It's mm -hmm. the folk in the middle. It's the town folk. It's the rest of us who are trying oh. to reconcile. I'm a good person. How did I do that dumb thing? I'm still a good person. I'm gonna downplay this dumb thing. <laughs> you, I'm gonna that, downplay the, the something. 
See? Yes. And so what social psychology would say, a lot of the some things you're doing are because everybody around you is doing them. And for it sure. is very difficult for people to, you know, to be the nail that stands up and says, you know what, I'm going to protest this. I'm going to disagree with this. I'm going to blow the whistle. I'm going to blow the whistle. Mm. Yeah, we love um, whistleblowers, theoretically. Yes. Not practically. Exactly. Not in the way they're treated. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, well, I guess this leads to my next question. What is confirmation bias? Uh, and I know well, all I've... the smart people in the room, all, all 543 <laughs> of you went, I know what it is, but yes. we're going to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. It is. <laughs> well, it's, it's quite interesting, really. The human mind comes equipped with a whole little armamentarium of cognitive biases these help us get along in life. They help us manage our beliefs. They keep our beliefs consistent. They keep us operating in the world. But their biases um, of these, as the social psychologist Lee Ross says, my very favorite is the bias that we are not biased. <laughs> I'd quite love this. I see things clearly as they really are. Therefore, if I just sit down with you and explain clearly and calmly why you are wrong, if you don't agree with me, it is because you are biased and not seeing things clearly. So this is one kind of bias. But of course, the other one, the confirmation bias, is what is really the fundamental way that we reduce dissonance. All that the confirmation bias means is, as, as I'm sure everybody here knows, it is the disposition to look for evidence that confirms what we already believe, to look for it, to find it, to uproot it, you know, to ferret it out, to accept evidence that confirms what we believe, which allows us to reduce dissonance that we might be wrong. And it also means that we will ignore, minimize, forget, trivialize, any information that is dissonant with what we believe, that disconfirms what we believe. This is why science is so annoying to so many people. It's <laughs> yes. because science makes us put our beliefs to the test. It makes us face the dissonant possibility that we are wrong in our hypotheses. Um, but of course, it's what scientists love to do. When I talk to scientists, about their work, they say, but dissonance is a good thing. You know, I feel good when I've learned something. You know, I've learned something that my belief was wrong. Well, good for you. <laughs> but even scientists don't like that information as much as they might maybe should. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, as you said, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the person that you cited, but it is literally a physically uncomfortable feeling you know, like hunger or thirst to feel cognitive dissonance, which is why we rush to um, get rid of it. Um, I, I think it's, it's really important because this is such a great and accessible example in the book that, you know, people can take and walk around with. Um, and, and as we go forward with this conversation, what is the pyramid of choice? Uh, I, you know, this is a metaphor that we yes. developed and that has found, um, I think, extraordinary applicability. It, it works like this. It's hard for me to do this with, <laughs> without using my hands, but I will try. Um, this came originally from a study of school children. Imagine a pyramid, just, you know, a, a triangle, a pyramid, and you have two people at the top of this pyramid with the same middling attitude towards something, let's say cheating. They know that cheating is not a good thing. You really shouldn't cheat. But, you know, it's not the worst sin in the world and people cheat and it's no big deal. So there they are, right? Now these two students are taking a final exam on which their grade in the course rests. And they completely draw a blank, cannot think at all what the answers are. And now what are they going to do? You know, they're going to flunk out of this class. They're going to, their livelihood is ruined for life. Their cat will abandon them you know, the way that <laughs> students think all disaster will follow. When suddenly the student next to them makes her paper visible and the student has a, an immediate decision to make. Cheat, look at those answers, or don't cheat. This is the key thing. 
the minute a person steps off the pyramid in making one decision or another, cheat or don't cheat, they will now be in a state of cognitive dissonance and need to put their behavior in consonance with their attitude toward cheating. So the student who cheated will now think that cheating is really not a bad thing at all. Oh, for goodness sake, everybody in this class is cheating. It's no big deal. It's a victimless crime. Who cares? I'll never cheat again anyway. It's just this once, just for this test. Right. Whereas the student who resisted cheating to maintain their integrity will say, cheating is not a victimless crime. We all suffer from it. It's the wrong thing to do. And I would rather be morally correct and not cheat than get a grade that way. By the time the two of them have continued justifying the choice they made as they go down that pyramid, they will end up at the base of that pyramid very far apart from one another in their views about cheating. Now, what, what's interesting about this, people say, oh, well, isn't that just the slippery slope? Well, it is in the sense that we all know that expression that you start something and then before you know it, you've gone farther than you thought. But a slippery slope is not the right metaphor because a slippery slope is slippery. You slide as if you're not, you're just sitting there in the mud and you happen to slide. Uh uh. No. <laughs> cognitive dissonance is the active cognitive mechanism that we put into justifying the decision we make. It's active. And if you imagine, here you are at the bottom of this pyramid, you have now spent days and weeks justifying your cheating, say. How likely is it that you will go back up? the pyramid and rethink that initial decision that you made, not very. You are investing more and more mental time and effort in making sure that you believe you've done the right thing. When we look at the behavior of people who seem to be doing really lunatic crazy things or holding lunatic crazy beliefs, the people who had joined uh, Heaven's Gate, the cult for example, uh, or any cult, we think, huh? You know, what, what, how, how can they believe that? What we're not seeing is the process by which, step by self justifying step, they got themselves from a neutral position at the top to sincere and deep commitment at the bottom. Well, I, I think that puts us in the perfect place then, because I think uh, many of us many Americans, folk living here, we're at the bottom of this pyramid. And, and by this pyramid, I mean the pandemic. And we, those of us on one side of it cannot understand the people on the, on the other side of it. It's like, how did you get there? Um, mm -hmm. Or we're not even asking that question. We're just assuming that they're stupid. Or, you know, do, how could you, this be your information? So, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say some, a lot of that dissonance starts at the top. And, and maybe that was why I am. I'm, I'm at, is this the reason why you guys decided to add that, that latest chapter in your book? Okay. <laughs> so you oh, did you not want to start there? Oh, Are we not going to leap no, no, into no. the fray? <laughs> fray. I'm ready for the fray. I mean, what good is living if we don't get in the fray? That's right. Okay. No. Um, well, you have two things in there. One is, for example, the, ma the decision about masks, but the other is starting at mm -hmm. the top. Um, most people, most people let their political commitments or religious commitments or identity commitments do their thinking for them. This is mostly mm -hmm. efficient and effective. If I have to stop and think every morning, gee, you know, what's the latest data on brushing my teeth? You know, I would never get to breakfast. So, it's efficient to have shorthand ways of deciding what we think we think. And for many people, it's a political commitment. This is why it is not dissonant for us. If you're a Democrat and a Republican does something corrupt, offensive, and immoral, there's no dissonance because those people are always doing things that are corrupt, immoral, and so forth. If well, someone yeah. in our own party does it, someone in our own party does it, we are inclined to minimize, forget, trivialize, 
-hmm. how important that action was, even if it was, by the way, exactly the same behavior. So what we saw at the beginning of this tragic pandemic is the absolute failure of leadership by Donald Trump and his administration, the failure of a coherent and cohesive policy, the failure to yield to the scientists and the scientific panels who would offer a program of dealing with the pandemic from the beginning. Instead, it was a catch as catch can. It's something that changed this week, that week, the other week. Indeed, we may remember at the very beginning, Fauci said, you know, I don't really recommend masks. They don't help right. much. This was a big mistake that he made mm -hmm. because he thought he was making sure the masks would be available for our healthcare workers instead of being hoarded by our citizens. Whatever his reasons, by the time he got around to saying, you know, mask, everybody, mask up, mask up. <laughs> The people who were Trump supporters from the beginning, who were hearing this whole thing was just a hoax and a fraud and it wasn't really something to be seriously considered, um, were just taking their directives, their instructions from him. I'm not wearing no stinking mask, which is not actually what's said in Treasure of the Sierra Madre, by the way, in terms of badges, but okay, <laughs> close enough. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, for Trump followers and Trump supporters, masks, you know, they just interrupt my freedom and they don't work anyway and uh, I, don't, I don't need them. So masks quickly became a symbol of whether you were a Trump loyalist or one of those lunatic scientific democrato nerds, yeah? Wow. So that, that's how the symbolism came to affect the decision of whether or not masks are helpful, whether or not the pandemic is serious, and whether or not I myself should wear a mask. And it's why, um, in the absence of coherent governmental policy, which so many other countries have managed to institute, we muddle along with our citizens fighting one another over the best way to cope with this thing. I, I sadly, um, I, I went down the rabbit hole, uh, the Instagram video rabbit hole, much like the YouTube rabbit hole, the Twitter rabbit hole. And there was a video um, that some folks, some anti-maskers uh, were do, had done in a, a supermarket, a local supermarket oh. in California. I wish I knew which one since you're West oh, Coast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, they, they were pulling every reason in the book. It's my freedom, you know, and at some point I heard Jesus. I'm like, wait a minute, Jesus didn't, what are you, what are you saying? Well, but they, God, will, God will save me. God will protect yes, me. Yes, yes. I get sick. Mm -hmm. And this seemed to justify the harassing behavior they were doing to other shoppers, to other, uh, to the people that work there. And, you know, if, if what you're saying, you know, if, we're, if we go by maybe giving people the benefit of the doubt, these people in their everyday lives think that they are good, kind, smart people. And they are evangelizing in the supermarket, which first of all, I just want to get in and out. Please don't do that to me. But they were serious. It got so bad, they shut down the supermarket for that day. Oh, yes. Well, a few things are going on in that situation. First of all, the screaming woman in the supermarket, uh, this is not at the beginning of the pandemic. This is, this is many, many weeks, many weeks and months of um, getting a harder and harder, more committed view about loyalty to Trump and dissociating yourself from the people who wear masks. There was a wonderfully interesting cognitive dissonance study that was titled, When in Doubt, Shout. And I think we all know this experience. I don't, I don't really have an argument against you. I don't really know what I think here. And I really don't know how to rebut your incontrovertible evidence that masks will save lives. Therefore, I will just scream at you. Yeah. And that is in fact how many people argue. I don't really have the evidence, but I just know I'm not wearing no damn mask. And it's like shouting down the opposition. If I can shout you down, I don't have to examine whether my belief mm. is justified or not. I can just scream at you. Um, that woman is screaming, as so many other anti-maskers are, to solidify their position down that pyramid. Because the minute they say, Mm -hmm. Well, and by the way, we are starting to hear stories of um, 
people who got sick with COVID. You may have seen this this family whose uh, father died of COVID, and she said the only uh, coexisting condition he had is that he was a Trump supporter. Father yes. died. Okay, saw that story and, during the yeah. DNC. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and so exactly. Oh, right, and so. Um, Again, you have to keep in mind, what would it take for these people who for months have been allying themselves with Trump's views about the pandemic, it's all gonna go away like a miracle and we're gonna get our economy back and so forth. What is it gonna take for them now to say, I was wrong and this president was wrong? You know, in our last chapter, you'd mentioned the last chapter and I wanna say one thing about it, the demagogue. Indeed, Donald Trump is a classic play it by the book, demagogue. You inspire fear, uh, panic, and alarm, and you tell the population that you are the only person who can save them. That's it, that's the demagogue's playbook. What we do in that chapter, though, is not a moralistic war discussion between Democrats and Republicans. No. Our interest, rather, is Republicans versus Republicans because it's a metaphor, an issue that all of us face when having to make decisions for our own group, our own identity, our own political party. The story we tell in that chapter is the story of how many Republicans slid down the pyramid yeah. justifying their original, I mean, let's say many millions of people voted for Trump because they recognized the racism and because they were evangelicals and they knew he was gonna give them the power they wanted and because of the Supreme Court, okay. But there were plenty of Republicans, the majority of Republicans who voted for him holding their noses, who didn't like his bigotry, who didn't like his sexism, who thought he was a jerk. And yet they, they were Republicans, so what do I do? I'm a Republican, I vote Republican. Our story in that chapter is what it took for so many Republicans to peel themselves off that self-justifying slide to the bottom. Yeah. To this day, there are many at the base, literally the base, who will never <laughs> change their minds about him. Right. But what's been interesting to see is what it has taken Republican after Republican to say, you know what, I can't go any further. I'm out of here, I'm out of this administration, I'm finally speaking up, I'm finally writing my book, you know? I'm finally right. telling the world what a moron he is. Yeah. And each of them came to their own decision of when they had to say, I cannot support him any further. Well, given what you just said, I think the more interesting book would not, is not what a moron he is, but what a moron I was. Here's how I got here, you guys, and I'm sorry. But if, I, if I've read the work correctly, saying that I was wrong or saying that I made a mistake or changing my mind is one of the absolute hardest things for people oh. to do. Nobody wants to do that. It's, too, it's very hard. Well, and in this case, it, it really is. I supported a man who, who is so corrupt, who is so undemocratic, who is trampling the norms and institutions of our country. It's very hard to do. And in our last yes. chapter, the, the comments we have from the Republicans who finally said no more are, uh, some of them are really harrowing. You, can, you hear in their comments, I've been a Republican all my life. How, right. can, how could I have been, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have yeah. been so selfish? Um, right. And you, know, you also see how hard it is to, to break away, to admit Oh, it's it. very difficult, very difficult. You know, that very example, um, I, I'm not sure if this was night one or night two of the RNC when former football player Herschel Walker uh, okay. spoke, and he has been an almost four decades friend of the president, and he sincerely and heartfeltly said, how can you say that I've been friends with a racist? Oh, yeah. Now, I sat in my living room and I said, well, <laughs> sir, I have a list for you, <laughs> but, oh, yeah. but he couldn't hear oh, yeah. me. But it is that exact question that he actually wasn't asking himself, exactly. which is, you know, because, you know, cognitive dissonance, as you said, is not about lying to other people. It's about lying to yourself. 
and how yes. difficult would it be for him mm -hmm. four mm -hmm. decades in 37 years in to go wow maybe he he was nice to me but oh yeah you know well i mean one of elliot's most famous studies um <laughs> called severity of initiation on liking for the group which <sighs> basically was a study that showed the more well, hazing, the more embarrassment, time, effort, money, and so forth, that we invest in something, a belief, a program, a friendship, a relationship, a mm -hmm. marriage, the more time, money, effort, and heartache we put in that, the harder it is going to be for us to say, mm. <laughs> mm, time to rethink this, time to rethink yeah. this. Relationships survive because of our ability to reduce dissonance, meaning... Uh, as Elliot says, you know, and in the first flush of love, the other person is the perfect person. There's not a flaw in them at all. And then yeah. suddenly there's a tiny, tiny flaw. Okay, you know, oh, he, he's an alcoholic, tiny. You know, that's, right. that's a that's tiny right. flaw. Okay, but, but the point being that all relationships survive to the extent that we can, we, we, we focus on the things about the relationship that we enjoy and right. value. And we minimize, ignore, forget, and trivialize information that is discrepant with our wishes for that relationship. This is the, the reason for that mysterious phenomenon that the minute a couple decides to divorce, they can't remember they ever liked each other. Have you noticed no. that? Oh, I have <laughs> noticed that. <laughs> Oh, the Facebook that. feuds are notorious. Uh, <laughs> what, what happened? What happened? Right. Nothing happened. Nobody changed. It's just that the focus of attention came to be on all of those negative things, which right. now confirm my decision to leave you. So dissonance, the power of dissonance. I must say, for me, working with Elliot on this book, I think the most powerful stories we tell um we you know we have chapters on memory and the justice system and prejudice and war and, and you, so forth you do have a chapter or two on love i believe i skipped ahead oh, to yes. that oh, one yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes but you know for us it was finding a story at the end of each chapter of somebody who faced the dissonance they felt and as they tell their stories, for me, these were so vivid. A district attorney who agreed to have the DNA tested on a man he put in prison for 37 years. The guy said, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. And the DA said, oh, for crying out loud, all right, we'll do a DNA test. Sure that he would find out that the man was guilty. When he learned he'd put an innocent man in prison for 37 years, you feel the anguish in what he has to admit to himself. Most district attorneys don't. Instead, they reduce dissonance by saying, well, he wasn't guilty of this, but he was guilty of something else. We're gonna just keep him in prison another 10 years, which is another thing that seems mysterious to observers, and yet it's all too common. Is some of that ego? All of it's ego. All of it's ego, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, all no. Of it, I, I, all of it is in the service of protecting our self-esteem and our self concept. I mean, you know, um, Americans, <laughs> this is the Lake Wobegon effect. Americans think of themselves as being better than average. <laughs> I mean, a majority of Americans think they're better than average. My favorite study is that 88% of all Americans think they're better drivers than average. <laughs> and the other 12% are here in Los Angeles. What can I say? <laughs> you know, but really? <laughs> so, so to preserve that belief that we're better than average that's that's where the ego is yeah well yeah especially if you're invested in that i i remember i this is not huge but when i was in grammar school i when i graduated i was valedictorian and so then i went to a special high school into private high school and everybody was smart so all of a sudden you know everybody's a valedictorian so what and i i actually had for the first time, real difficulty in class. Um, I had an earth science class and it just 
it mm -hmm. shook me. It shook 14 year old me, but I, I'm smart. And my father mistakenly thought he was helping. He said, well, well, baby, why don't you get a tutor? A tutor? <laughs> <laughs> Smart oh, no. people don't need to. I mean, it was it really affected oh. how I saw myself. Um, and honestly, my dad helped me reframe it. He goes, "Not you're not always going to be great at everything, and it's better to admit when you need help. And the smart thing is to get help. Smart people dad. get help when they need it. Oh, my dad, Renaissance oh. man, Renaissance right. man. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm being biased. <laughs> <laughs> you're being very accurate, no doubt. Well, but see... The other thing that is so, so fascinating about all of this is, so if someone said to you, Leah, I've been thinking about our friendship, which has gone on now for, you know, we've been having this argument for the last 12 and a half years, and I've been thinking about it, and you are absolutely right. What was I thinking to have disagreed with you? You're, you're brilliant. <laughs> your, your, your entire theory of this is right, and I'm, I could not have been wronger, <laughs> you know, okay? Is, why is that hard for people to do? Is the other person going to be angry at you? Are you kidding? They're no, gonna, you get a bigger Christmas in. present. That's yeah, how that yeah. works. That's how that works. Exactly. That's how that works. And yet, and yet, see, that is the unpredictability and the fascinating element of cognitive dissonance. We are so eager to preserve our view of ourselves that, that even to say, I'm going to put down this burden here and admit the mistake I made. As doctors, when doctors admit a medical error, their patients are relieved to know that doctor is a human being who will make mistakes and who will learn from what the doctor did wrong so that the doctor won't do it again. We long to hear people say, uh, I, I was wrong, if they mean it. <laughs> You know, that, that, that brings me to um, an example that I, I read in your book that was amazing, touching, and life-changing. Um, and I, I'd like you to share that story. It's the, the Ronald Reagan, Shimon oh. Perez story, oh. Oh, if you sure. should. Oh, sure. Well, right. People always say to us, well, so what do you do about this? How do you live with dissonance? What, I yeah. mean, what, what do we do here? How, what, what's the take home message? Uh, are we doomed or are we not doomed? No, we are not doomed because when you understand how dissonance works, when you know on, it's gonna follow- Hang on follow one second, Carol. We're, we have 560 people and I wanna make sure you guys just heard that. We are not doomed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Carol, please okay, continue, right. please. Okay, sure, sure. Well, what it means when you understand when you understand how dissonance works, what it feels like, it means we can learn to put some space between the two cognitions that are dissonant and consider them on each of their merits and think about them. So the story we tell, the best example of this is when Ronald Reagan agreed to go to the cemetery, Bitburg Cemetery in Germany to have some German US uh, official event and to lay wreaths at this cemetery, it turned out that 47 Nazi soldiers were buried there with honors. And of course there was such a, an outcry against Reagan going to this cemetery to do this. And Reagan's great good friend, the then Israeli um, uh, Premier Shimon Peres said to Reagan, you can't do this. You just can't do this. Holocaust survivors around the world, Jews, everybody, I mean, people were just outraged. Mm -hmm. So someone said to Perez, what do you think of the fact that your friend Ronald Reagan went to Bitburg to do this? And Perez said, when a friend makes a mistake, the friend remains a friend and the mistake remains a mistake. This is staggeringly wise, because what would the normal impulse be when a friend makes a mistake? Friendship over, that's it, we're done. Mm -hmm. Or I minimize the mistake you made, the thing you did, the harm you caused. Not important, let's just get on with it. The friendship is more important. What Paris was saying is no, let's consider both of these things and weigh them equally. 
and I believe you have a little show and tell for this crowd. On yes, just this yes, point. we do. We do. Uh, we do have a, I guess, a modern example of that, which actually uh, touches my industry. Um, I'm sure you guys, just to give it a little context, um, we, within the comedy community, had our, our, our share of Me Too's, shall we say. And uh, there was uh, Louis C.K. was uh, accused of sexual harassment, correctly so. And his friend, colleague and friend, Sarah Silverman, did a video, you know, confronting her feelings about that, which I guess was her Ronald Reagan, Shimon Perez moment. And so we'd like to show you that video. Um, Mike, uh, our wonderful tech person, if you could share your screen and cue that up. Uh, again, it's a modern day example of what we're talking about. Full disclosure, I'm, I'm still processing all this shite, uh, but here's where I'm at on it as of this moment. It could change tomorrow, and if it does, I will keep you posted. One of my best friends of over 25 years, Louis C.K., masturbated in front of women. He wielded his power with women in, in fucked up ways, sometimes to the point where they left comedy entirely. I could... <clears throat> I could couch this with heartwarming stories of our friendship and uh, what a great dad he is, but that's totally irrelevant, isn't it? Um, yes, it is. It's, it's a real mind fuck, uh, you know, because I, I love Louis, um, but Louis did these things. Both of those statements are true. So I just keep asking myself, can you love someone who did bad things? Can you still love them? Uh, I can mull that over later, certainly, because the only people that matter right now are the victims. They are victims, and they're victims because of something he did. So I hope it's okay if uh, I am at once very angry for the women he wronged and the culture that enabled it, and also sad, because he's my friend. But I believe with all my heart that this moment in time is essential. It's vital that people are held accountable for their actions, no matter who they are. We need to be better. We will be better. I can't fucking wait to be better. <laughs> <laughs> oh my it. gosh, that, yeah, See? perfect, perfect example. She, how many of us have felt that struggle or have, have ra risen our awareness to the nuance to deal with that struggle because as you said most of us are called to disparage or deny the relationship i never knew that person that i've known for 20 years or exactly. oh he didn't mean it are you sure mm -hmm. she tackled that yeah. head on which yeah. you know if we put that in the context of the pandemic how mm -hmm. do we reach the other side how do we look from our bottom side of the pyramid to the other bottom side of the pyramid uh, none of this is easy no, it's not easy. See, um, this is really the interesting thing, which is why I'm happy to be part of the skeptic community, really, which is an appreciation of nuance and complexity, which is so often missing in our national discourse, needless to say, um, but is so crucial. Um, you know, some uh, celebrity or somebody we love or admire is accused of something or other or has committed some crime and so forth. And it's just easy to write them off and to get all high-minded about it. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, some nuance and complexity is called for because we are all human and we are all full of things that, you know, we all of us do things that we wish we hadn't and nobody is 100% oh. pristine perfect, you know, not even... Uh, yeah, so... Um, not even me, not even me. Go ahead and say it, well, Carol, not even me. <laughs> no, you. No, you are an exception. It's very clear to you. <laughs> I wish. I'm I wish. I'm you, Leanne. Listen, you Thank you. Thank yes. you. I will drop I was... my copay in the mail. Okay, fine. Thank you. <laughs> no, you know what? Never mind. Never mind the copay. Um, Love it. Look, it's, um, we see this over and over. Um, you know, if, uh, if a writer has said something or written something that in today's light we disapprove of, then that writer's work has to be, you know, disappeared. Ah, this is, Mark Twain, uh, yes. 
Oh, yes, for example. <laughs> for oh, example. my goodness. For I know. example. I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that doesn't help anybody or teach anybody anything and it's uh it's not good for literature it's not good for science it's not good i mean it, it, it is a it it's the impulse of the self-righteous and it's very easy to get on our self-righteous self-justifying high horse and go galloping off in that spirit of righteous indignation it's very satisfying <sighs> feels good feels yeah. good and then, by the way, when that self-righteousness turns into a mob and takes down a few innocent people along the way, you know, I, I've seen mobs of the left and right in my long lifetime. And what do they always say? Well, so if a few innocent people get thrown under the bus, so what? So what? You know, if it's your brother, father, sister, mother, friend gets thrown under the bus, then you care. Yeah. Um, and that's never a reason to sort of go off whole hog with, with, uh, you know, these self-justifying retributive impulses, not if we want really to change things for the better. One of the lessons I re realized when I was writing Anger all these many years ago, as I said to you earlier, I was only a teenager at the time, uh, but that book on Anger was, was a useful exercise for me personally and politically in the sense of coming to understand that there's a difference between the anger we use to change the world and the anger we use just to make the other person feel as bad as we do. You know, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a time and place for that, but the latter doesn't get things done. It gets attention to the thing that needs to be done. That's its usefulness. But for the long haul, we need what one journalist said, the little flare of anger, the little flare of anger that keeps us motivated and moving toward justice and correction and improving our lives. Um, but self-righteousness, self-justifying, I'm better than you, mm, no. Yeah, yeah, we're just going to call that my 20s <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, exactly and right. say that I've, I've grown, <laughs> I've grown since then. See? See? We, is that a good thing? <laughs> oh, it is, it is. That, is. that is the one thing I do like uh, about getting older and thankfully incrementally wiser. Um, but Carol, we have a lot of questions. Um, mm in the chat and um, I'd like to, well, first of all, I will be honest here and put on my glasses so I make sure that I see them and right. uh, get them in. Um, someone, yes, absolutely, you guys, this talk will be available uh, within the week on skepticalinquirer.org. Uh, um, hmm. This is curious. Did you, I asked you, you were a social psychologist and I asked you to define that. Is there a difference between social psychology and sociology? Ah, uh, you think of it this way. Think of a, a Venn diagram. Psychology is the study of the individual. Sociology is the study of institutions, groups, large scale uh, institutions. And social psychology is the intersection of the two. It's the study of how those organizations and institutions and other people affect us as individuals. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is an unfair question. You, you feel free to pass at any time. Okay. Um, right. Are we suffering from a cultural psychosis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a clinician. <laughs> okay, there we go. There a we go. Cultural psychosis. Okay, now that you'd have to define your terms in that respect. Right, I will, exactly. Well, well, no, no, no. Uh, listen, the, the question reflects, are we as a culture in trouble? That, I think, is a reasonable and very important question. Because I do think that as a nation, as a society, we are facing a very serious crisis for democracy. And I'm worried as hell about it. Not that this has much to do with cognitive dissonance necessarily, but that's the concern. Psychosis, well, you know, it's easy to say the other guy's crazy, that, but that's not the problem we're facing. Right, yes. No, I've, I've said it many times, and it has been my relationship-ending statement. You're crazy! And then yeah. <laughs> slam the door, and out I go, feeling very self-righteous and justified. It feels good, um, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it does, yeah. you know, and then the next day, not so much. Now, someone said, please talk about QAnon. I'm imagining that is within the scope of... Um, cognitive dissonance because clearly no, we that, think that these folks are off their talk. rockers no, that, that was <laughs> that was for joe's session on on conspiracy theories let's we yes. don't need to go there yeah yes uh let's see oh we oh well okay once again i'll add a postscript to that except in this respect remember i said we 
We let our identities and affiliations do our thinking for us. And this is one of the problems we see with the internet. You know, once you have defined yourself a certain way or defined yourself as part of a particular group, then you will start looking for information from that group. You will go to their websites. You will believe what they say. And you won't be inclined to say, really, what's the evidence for this deep state thing? You know? um, so that's the real danger is that it comes from uh, the proliferation of crazy, <laughs> I won't say psychotic, but certainly not very realistic attitudes that proliferate on the internet and support what somebody already thinks. You know, it's like um, um, ideas, for ideas to take hold, they have to land on fertile ground. And that's why as we watch this whole election play out, um, what Trump supporters say and what Biden supporters say in terms of advertising is gonna fall on on different audiences that are already disposed to believe what their party leaders uh, are saying. Someone, Martin, has asked, uh, what is the difference between cognitive dissonance and com com compartmentalization? Oh, well, I guess I would say compartmentalization, which may or may not have anything to do with the motivational state of reducing the discomfort we feel caused by dissonance, but it is one way that we do reduce dissonance by saying, this is how I behave over here and this is how I behave over here. So compartmentalization is our ability to say, well, I'm this kind of person in, at work and this kind of person at home and um, I do this thing here and this other thing there. Um, but that's, as a social psychologist, I would say that's normal. That's how we all live. We aren't just one right. single you right. know, person. Of course, our behavior changes in different situations. So to the, the extent that we can say, you know, I'm going to leave work at work and I'm going to come home and be the person I am at work, that's compartmentalizing. But when we use it to reduce dissonance by saying, well, then, then it can be one tool we use to do that. I, this next question, Carolyn Brown ha, is asking, um, I believe you tackle um, in the last chapter of your book, and I, I, I think we talked about it, but I'm not sure if it happened live in this conversation. Uh, she wants to know, does the current occupant of the White House, that is my phrasing, because I just refuse, <laughs> <laughs> does the current occupant of the White House have cognitive dissonance? Oh, great question. No. He is the only person <laughs> on the planet who does not feel dissonance, because... I love this, actually. Uh, first of all, he never makes a mistake. He has never made a mistake, as you well know. Uh, and he doesn't lie, even though he has now made, what are we up to, 25,000 lies since he took office. No, the, the thing, what's, what's really, hmm, the reason he makes such a good example for our last chapter is, in order to feel cognitive dissonance, you have to have the capacity for empathy, um, for guilt, for remorse, for sorrow, for understanding, the human emotions that connect us to one another. If you don't have the capacity to feel sorry for something you've done that really seriously harmed another person, then you can't feel dissonance when you learn that you have done so, right? So for mm. Trump, who has no, as far as we can tell, no such capacity, he is the classic con man. Con, do I have to say con person? <laughs> I don't want to say con person. No, con, okay, con women, there are con women. If you're a con artist. There we go. You, yes, you don't feel dissonance over your horrible behavior of stealing somebody's life savings because your view is they're chumps. Your job is to take advantage of somebody. If they're going to be a chump, so you just take their money. So, you know, Trump sold his stakes and his university and whatever other things he did. Does he care that people lost thousands of dollars or that he stiffed his contractors who worked for him or that he denied housing to the African-Americans who applied for how I mean no he has no feeling for any of these things that he did so no he would not feel dissonance his view is just they're chumps they're chumps my job is to take advantage of them He's not um, alone in this. He's not alone in this. We, <laughs> but no, no, I, 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 I've dated a guy like that. So yeah. you know, clearly I, <laughs> I absolutely get it. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, Carolyn, thank you for that question. I have a question from Mark, and I can't pronounce your last name, and I don't want to butcher it. Um, they are asking, he is asking, does righteousness, quote unquote, tend to correlate with the presence or absence of cognitive dissonance? Does anything correlate with cognitive dissonance? Cognitive dissonance isn't a thing that something correlates with. Cognitive dissonance is a mechanism, a, a, a mental process that sees to it that we feel good and comfortable about what we're doing and what we believe. Um, righteousness is, let's say, the energy of resolving dissonance um, because it, one way to, re to reduce dissonance is to feel that we are right and righteous in our beliefs. Um, so I wouldn't say it correlates with, but it is certainly something we see in the many people who reduce dissonance by, as I said earlier, getting off in a self-righteous mode. <sighs> Shout, shouting as they go. Right? Yes. I, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that, and I just, I shake my head because I think how much time I wasted. How, my, how much time I wasted trying to be right. You know... Elliot and I once did a workshop years ago that I, I went along because he's a consummate teacher and I wanted to see how he did this. And he had a, he had a, he, he used this met method that I think is really useful for people. See, when we, we all know that we can't improve our, our practice, our behavior, if we don't learn from our mistakes. Little kids learn this early on, okay? But little kids don't believe it because they think if you make a mistake, it means you're stupid and nobody wants to think they're stupid. But if we are going to ever learn, we must be able to face our mistakes and learn from them and change. Now, if dissonance blocks us from doing that, from not being able to say, oh, thank you for pointing out this wonderful new thing that I didn't know about, <laughs> then we aren't gonna learn, we aren't gonna change. And then we're gonna reach a great old age having stayed stuck doing the same things with the same thoughts forever. So what Elliot said to this group in the workshop was this. I love this question. This, the topic was regret, which in a way is a stupid emotion because you can't do anything about regret except feel regretful that you're always feeling regret and it doesn't go anywhere. You know, feeling, oh, I made this mistake 25 years ago. What are you gonna do about that? Unless that awareness is something you use to change your way going forward. That's why it matters. So he said to this group, at the time you made this decision that you now regret, at the time you made the decision, what did you know that you didn't want to know? Now, if you think about this for a minute, this is really terrific. If we think about all the times we wanted to do something, something small, whether it was, or whether it was a car to buy or a person to marry or a job to take, there was often some little niggly voice, you know, some best friend saying, are you out of your mind? Or don't do this or think about this. And what everybody in the group finally said was, I didn't want to hear what my friends had to say to me. I didn't want to hear them, so I shut them out. If we are able to take that realization going forward and to try to be more open to, as Doris Kearns Goodwin said of Lincoln, to having a team of rivals, to having other people with other points of view tell us where we might be going off track in our decision making. That ideally is something we can learn from. Ideally, mm. not so easy. Yeah, I, I, when, I, when you told me about that, I, I thought of that in the context of, of the red flags I might have ignored for some things, instead of going, wow, that's a red flag. I go, oh, look at all those pretty red flags I'm going to ignore. <laughs> exactly right. And just, because I'm going to be different. Uh-huh. I, well, let, let, me, let me just pause here. We are a little bit past the top of the hour. Um, and while we're scheduled for an hour, I, I did not plan anything after this except seriously cuddling with my cat. Uh, <laughs> so we, we, I would love to, to there are some really thoughtful questions here. And so, Carol, is it all right if we sort of do okay, a few more? Sure. A few okay. more it is. Yeah. Just wanted, just wanted to make sure. Just wanted to make sure. Oh, okay. Thank I you. I think this Thank is you. an interesting thought experiment. 
uh, from Fran or Franklin, I think that name is. Uh, how would a, uh, I hate the way you phrase this question, so I'm going to say it. <laughs> how would a Trump supporter uh, describe the cognitive dissonance of pro mask people? <laughs> How would a Trump supporter suppose a dissonance? Yeah, like what do they think our cognitive dissonance is? Like, well, well, clearly we're sheep. You know, clearly we like to be controlled. You know, clearly we don't oh. we, we don't we don't do our research, and you know, we Dr. Fauci was wrong. Yeah. You know. Okay. You just you just answered it perfectly. I did. And I'm sorry. You did. <laughs> and well, and by the way, by the way, I mean one of the more interesting things I learned not long ago in reading about the 1918 pandemic is that anti-maskers were alive and well during the 1918 pandemic too. So this Stop. suggests it's not, it's not just a, uh, a, a Trump thing. It's that American freedom individually thing that <laughs> gets us into so oh. much trouble, but it really was from that. And we're not wearing masks. In San Francisco, they, they institute a mandate to wear masks with a fine if you didn't wear a mask. And so many people refused to wear the mask that they had to drop the mandate. So, you know, Americans do have this um, don't tread on me <laughs> view, which they will hold to as the elephant stomps them to death. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Ooh, this is okay. There's a, there's a lot of text here. Um, you we can't go so on to midnight, though. Oh, no, 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 we can't. No, we can't. No, we can't. Um, you know, I, what, I, what I'm seeing here, and I take this as a credit to, you know, people enjoying the talk, they're saying, is this available? Can I see this again? Uh, so there, <laughs> okay. there's a lot of that. And to all of you who are asking that, yes, yes, yes. Um, someone has asked the name of your book, and the, the title of the book is Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. Um, Carol, I'm going to get the subtitle wrong, but that is the title. <laughs> of it the is. book and she was co-authored, uh, Carol Tavares and uh, Elliot Aronson are, are co-authors of that book and absolutely worth reading, uh, especially with the added chapter at the end and you clarified it, it's not a Republicans versus Democrats thing, but a Republicans versus Republicans thing. How do you, you, how do you go back once you've doubled down uh, mm -hmm. of a favorite phrase these days? Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a very, very thoughtful uh, okay, let me see. Uh, oh, I like this. This is almost related to um, the, one of the questions I wanted to wrap up with in a few is how does one go about recognizing their own cognitive dissonance? Ah, uh, um, well, given that it's mostly unconscious, it's not an easy <laughs> thing to do. You mean it doesn't introduce <laughs> itself to you? Hi, I'm your cognitive Hi. dissonance. We're going to hang out today. Well, sometimes you, sometimes you know it by the feeling of queasiness, embarrassment, or shame um, when the information just hits you and you can't ignore it. Um, for example, I mean, I love this, skeptics, we all pride ourselves on our skepticism, right? So mm. when we are shown to have gullibly accepted something that, you know, came into our, uh, our inbox or, you know, something that somebody told us and we passed it on without vetting it, without thinking about it. I mean, that, that feeling of, hmm, <laughs> did, did I really just do that? That's a ping of dissonance because mm -hmm. here I, a skeptic, forwarded this information that, you know, on one second look at, you know, Snopes would have shown to be completely spurious. Right. So, um, you pay attention to those feelings of discomfort um, and embarrassment and insecurity. And also, and also, you, you remain aware that every time we make a decision, from small decisions to large decisions, dissonance will follow. Dissonance will see to it that the choice you didn't make will seem less and less attractive to you, less and less sensible to you um, and the decision you did make will seem more and more the only thing you could have done the wisest smartest cutest decision you could ever have made right and so being aware of that can help us focus where relevant where necessary 
on the information we have begun to exclude that might threaten our certainties. I, I think for me, it's if I notice my first response or, or initial response is to get a little defensive, I uh -huh. go, oh, oh, wait a minute. What, what's when that? When in doubt, shout. When in doubt, right, shout. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, Charles Miller, my dear, you ask an insightful and painful question. And uh -oh. so I will, I will ask this. Since you are obviously taking a political side in the conversation, how do you make sure you are not experiencing the same cognitive dissonance as well? Well, a fine question. I don't know if that's and more for you or me, because I'm pretty clear. <laughs> oh, right. Well, uh, so I'm going to start. There's a large answer and a small answer. One of the things we say in the introduction to our book is how many um, criticisms we got in reviews and Amazon reviews and so forth over the years from Republicans who were very angry at us for bashing Republicans and never bashing Democrats. And uh, I mean, we, we get that, but in fact, in, in fact, as cognitive dissonance theory would predict, those writers did not notice the many examples of Democrats oh. whom we accused of exactly the same thing. Lyndon Johnson was called the master of self-justification. You know, it wasn't just George Bush that we're talking about. Um, so, so there's a tendency to, uh, to dis I mean, we were at pains to show where Democrats have made mistakes. Well, we're at pains to show as in this last chapter, all presidents lie all presidents have lied. John F. Kennedy lied about having written profiles in Courage and getting a, a prize for it. Um, it we, we know that presidents lie. The magnitude of the lies of this president is simply way out of the ordinary. In particular though, and it's a very good question, how do I deal with the dissonance that I feel over candidates that I care about or have voted for? And I do. Um, I have, and I remember over the years, how much as I supported Barack Obama, when he did things that I strongly disapproved of and would have been outraged by had a Republican president did them, I tended to say, eh, not so serious. I mean, look at these other things he's doing. And okay, it's not really, not such a bad thing. Now I see that for just what it was. But interestingly, the... Um, Recent research on, um, oh, well, you know what, that, that's another topic, Leanne, which is the whole question of partisan bias and fairness and so forth. I, I, we don't need to get into that here, except because it, it's, it's the question that everybody asks. Do, does, do Republicans and Democrats differ in how open they are to, uh, to disconfirming uh, evidence? That's, that's a whole other subject. Right. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, no, 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 no. Thank you. No, the, oh, the, the, the depth of these questions. Um, mm -hmm. Someone, uh, Jason Jensen says that cognitive dissonance doesn't seem very adaptive. Uh, why do we have this tendency? Why do we have such a strong need to see ourselves as good or intelligent mm -hmm. at the cost of deceiving ourselves yep. about what's true? Oh, absolutely. Excellent question. We, we get this question very often, and what can possibly be beneficial about it? Well, the answer is that obviously it has been, for most of human history, tremendously beneficial and adaptive. Um, I mean, as Elliot once said to me, it's what lets people sleep at night, you know, not, not worrying that you've done the wrong thing. Um, but I would put it this way. Mostly cognitive dissonance, the ability to reduce dissonance is tremendously adaptive for our human species. But keep in mind that it's only in our relatively recent history that we have had the proliferation of social identities, of beliefs, of ideas that exist in the world today. If you're living in a small group of people, you know, not many, then the function of believing that your group is the one right true group and you'll do anything you can to support your uh, belief that this is the best group in the world obviously that had a terrifically adaptive function that kept us from feeling like 
like like marbles rolling around in the universe, disconnected from each other. We lived in bands because we needed our band membership. Now comes another band saying, you know what? Your religion is stupid, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and you don't know what you're doing. Well, now you have to think about how to justify your commitment, your belief to your way of life and to your beliefs. So I would say that. I'll, I'll just do a couple of more because there, there, there's a, a common theme in some of these questions, not just for you tonight, but I, I, I saw this on our very first uh, lecture with Joe Yuzinski and a little bit um, with Paul, Paul Offit. There seems to be a genuine uh, curiosity on what do I do with people who are on the complete opposite side from me you know how do how do i reach across the aisle how do i heal this rift how do i even talk to this person uh someone put it very eloquently they said how do we use this to help us understand the idiots on the other side <laughs> <laughs> well thank said. you gary for that oh, hilariously please. put question and, and, and but yet very sincere mm -hmm. but exactly. but again the the true sincerity is people going but it might be somebody you love or like, or you, you're just trying to be a good person on your side of the pyramid. How, how do we do mm -hmm. this? Oh, do I have one or two sentences to answer that question with? You have as many <laughs> sentences as you oh, would like. It's the heartbreaking question of our time. It's the <sighs> heartbreaking question of our time. Um, well, first of all, skeptics uh, and scientists have had the concern forever and ever and ever about people who are anti-scientific or who you know don't accept science or the mm -hmm. vaccine issues. That is to say, specific issues. But in the years since the political polarization of America, which is a relatively new phenomenon, as people define themselves as Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, and so on. Um, you know, as I think you may know, people now say they would rather their son or daughter marry somebody from a different country or a different ethnicity or a different religion or even an atheist than somebody from that other party. Now, that's huge. That's wow. huge. Families have always consisted of people with different political persuasions. But when, the, when your view is a, somebody who holds that view is not just misguided, but evil, evil wrong-headed evil, then, then there's no arguing with them. There is no arguing with them. And then we face the choice when my brother holds a view that I hate, he remains my brother and what he believes is what I hate. And at that point, each of us makes decisions about, dare I say, family values or friendships or relationships what many families do, as they do about religion, as they do about gay rights, as they do about a thousand different issues. We're not talking about this, because if we talk about it, we will just get into a loud rant. And by the way, it is more important to me to preserve our, our family or our relationships or this friendship than to argue about this particular thing. If the particular thing becomes too big, then the friendship is over. You know, my, if the relative of mine became a Nazi, that done, you know, done. There's no ambiguity in that. But all of those are individual decisions we make and have always made, you know, because when you think about it, for the most part, we don't know how our friends and coworkers believe about many things. And yet we're friends and coworkers with them. So it's only when you sit down and say, oh, what do you believe about such and such that the animus can rise. Now that said, in my view, in terms of persuading another person, um, people are not gonna do it across party lines or even across religious lines. The people who change our minds are people who are like us, who once believed as we did and have changed their minds. That's the reason for, mm -hmm. I think, the powerful effectiveness of the Lincoln ads against Trump. They're made by Republicans, for Republicans, with examples of Republicans saying it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to mm -hmm. change your mind. I'm a rock ribbed Republican. I love my guns. I hate abortion. And I think Trump is a disaster for the country. Those are the people that have some chance of reaching 
Trump supporters. Um, but otherwise, if you're a Democrat and your spouse is a Republican, how do those people do this? But they do. Yeah. You just don't talk about it. You just don't talk about it. I remember my mother once saying to her brother-in-law, they were arguing about politics, and he used to bait her. And she said, you know what? If you want to talk to me about what I believe and why I believe it, I'm happy to tell you. Maybe we will find some common ground here. But if you just want to rail and rant, let's not do that. Let's not right. do that. And right. I think that's one way that you can begin a conversation. Uh, my, a friend of mine, a very dear friend, my co-author, Carol Wade, told me she was having an argument with a, a, a political argument with a, her neighbor opposed to uh, health care for all to Obamacare. And what he was most angry about was the mandate that healthy people had to buy insurance. He was furious about that. I'm a healthy person. Why do I have to pay a tax paying, you know, to pay new insurance? And she said, I have not had a car accident in 30 years and I'm paying insurance so that your son who has had four accidents in the last year and a half gets insurance. Interesting. The concept that people who don't have, you know, don't have health problems it's all a pool. It's all a pool. That's how insurance works, whether it's for your car, or your house, yeah. or your health. And, and he I, said, really? I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess that's the, the bonus of being able to have that conversation, but also to have that information to present to someone who's willing to hear it. And again, this is before all the shouting starts. If you don't get yeah. it in before the shouting. <laughs> get um, it in the, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're done for. Um, quite a number of questions and I, I guess I'll use this maybe as as the last one and I'll, I'll sort of aggregate it in addition to wanting to know how to talk to others uh, a lot of folks are sort of coming to the notion okay this cognitive dissonance thing is real I'm I have it now what do <laughs> I do you know I, I've experienced it so how can I be self-correcting what are what are what should I be looking for going forward uh, to to make sure that I I'm not just justifying, mm -hmm. I'm, being, I'm being rational instead of rationalizing. Well, as Elliot says, we aren't a rational species, we're a rationalizing oh, well. species, so don't okay. even go for the rational. You know, we can only try to approach it, you know? we can only keep pushing that rock up the hill and hope that we get a little further um, before it rolls down on our heads. Uh, the answer is, um, the answer is self-compassion. It's self-compassion. In the second edition of our book, we talk about, it's in this edition too, of course, the latest. We talk about, well, we should put it this way. The, the first time we wrote this book, our concern was the people who, who reduce dissonance too fast, too quickly, justifying themselves, and then end up creating all kinds of misery for themselves their, and the world. But in the second edition, we wanted to talk about people who c commit the other problem, which is beating themselves up all the time for decisions they made. Uh -huh. This girl. Uh, what? Who? <laughs> See me after this podcast. <laughs> I'll give you a private session. <laughs> no, it's, it's the people who, you know, this is what PTSD is, coming back from war and not being able to forgive yourself for Mm -hmm. crimes that you may have committed or for the horrors that you participated in. Um, but it's also people who have, you know, killed another person in a car accident and cannot forgive themselves, cannot forgive themselves. And the way Elliot puts this is that in America, we're, we tend to, to jump to self-forgiveness too soon. You know, it's a hot mm -hmm. topic. It's a good thing. Self-forgiveness is wonderful. You have to forgive yourself immediately because what else could you have done and da, da, da. And he says, you know, live with it for a while. Sometimes some sleepless nights are called for. Sometimes facing awareness of what you've done is the human way and the way we can really assess what we've done. It does not mean you keep beating yourself up forever and ever and ever, but it does mean that in order to get rid of that burden of regret and pain and suffering and so forth, self-flagellation, we have to think about ways to do something for others to make sure we don't do it again and that maybe somebody else won't do it the first time. I mean, these are, these are steps we do in action to reduce 
those feelings of anguish. It's a very important lesson. I mean, Elliot was concerned that, you know, Americans are sort of quick fix people, you know, and I'm going to get this book on self-compassion and then I'm going to feel good about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I've, I've never no, no, done no. that. You got to get the, do the work, got to do the work, but you let it go. Eventually you do have to let it go. Um, and that's the other human capacity that we have to, to learn from our mistakes if we're willing to admit them. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Carol, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I, I really appreciate it. And um, as so many of you have asked, uh, yes, we all of our Skeptical Inquirer Presents talks are recorded and will be available on the website for you to watch and review at your leisure. And that's skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, I'm I encourage you guys to come back. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying doing this series. I'm so glad so many of you are getting so much out of it. Our, our next uh, talks will be in September, and that begins up again on Thursday, September 10th, with Seema Yasmin, and she will be talking about viral BS, uh, mm -hmm. medical myths, and why we fall for them. And on the 24th, we have Nathan Lentz, who, if I recall correctly, was at SciCon last year, and he's, he will be speaking on Evolution Only Breaks Things, the Science denial at the heart of intelligent design. And so I want to say thank you to Skeptical Inquirer. I want to say thank you to uh, Team Mike, who uh, was working tech in the background. Thank you so much. And, and Carol, to you especially, thank you for sharing uh, your expertise and having this conversation with me and with us. Uh, I have to say, Leanne, I have to say, I can only be as good as my interviewer, and you are terrific. You were just wonderful, and I so enjoyed doing this with you. So a, a, a shout out to you for your good well, work on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and just so you know, all of my, my family and my friends are like, okay, Carol, who? What's going on? Because I've, I've been talking so much um, about your work and, and how much I, I find it of value. So I... Thank you for the compliment, but I've really been looking forward to this interview and this conversation. But I will see uh, as many of you as we can back here on September 10th. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend and watch that cognitive dissonance, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. <laughs> You're very welcome. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye.